Well, good morning, everyone. The psalmist would say, my soul clings to the Lord. And uh, we hold fast to him, don't we? And we hold fast to his word as we open up the word of God now. And that's how he, we hold fast to him. And we know he will hold us fast uh, through all of our days and all of our lives. So this morning, we're going to be uh, continuing our series in the art of Christian living. Last week, we started fighting sin. And this week, we're looking at shame, in a sense, exposing shame, bringing it to the light allowing uh, the Lord to minister to each one of our hearts. So we're going to start by turning to Genesis. In your pew Bibles, uh, just open that first page or two, and you should be there. Genesis chapter 2, verse 20, and we'll read to chapter 3, verse 10. So let's stand together for the reading of God's Word. Two twenty of Genesis, the man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field, but for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. So Yahweh God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Yahweh God had taken from the man, he brought into he made sorry into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that Yahweh God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of Yahweh God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of Yahweh God among the trees of the garden. But Yahweh God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Let's pray. Heavenly Father... As James has already mentioned, we don't want this to be a mechanical exercise of just speaking words, but Lord, that it might be with the unction of your spirit and with the movement of your spirit among us, Lord, transforming us and and blessing us. So Lord, we, we cling to the word that sets us free. We cling to the truth. We cling to your love, the love of the gospel. So Lord, open up our hearts today to receive and be blessed by you. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, that was the creation chapter. Genesis 1 moving into chapter 2. And something wonderful happened on day 6. The day that the Lord made the beasts and the livestock and then said, let us make man in our image. And man became a living being. The Lord said to Adam, come and meet your anesthetist. By the way, it's me. And meet the surgeon. It's also me. And the Lord took Adam, and he put Adam into a deep sleep. And then he took one of his ribs. And from that rib, God made woman. And then Adam started to sing, at last. 
Bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. This is the inspiration for Etta James' favorite song, her famous song, At Last. It will also be the theme of Seth and Bree's wedding in August. At last. <laughs> but at last, Adam said, bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. And what the two shall become one flesh. And it said, and God blessed them. So could it get any better than that? Man and woman come together. Woman taken out of man and made, and now the two coming together in one flesh. Is this not amazing relationship that God has allowed us to have? And the man and the woman were both naked and unashamed. The sermon title today is To Be Unashamed of Shame. And the goal of the sermon is to recognize that shame dwells in each one of our hearts and to encourage an ethos at Maple Avenue where we can bring our hearts to the light and that we might let love abound and that we might truly love one another here in this church family. So there'll be three parts to the sermon. Shame begins in Eden, the fall into shame. The second part will be shame on you and shame on me, the reality of shame. And then the last part, we'll look at a way forward loving one another at Maple Ave. So part one, the fall into shame. Where were Eve's eyes? Where was her heart? What was she seeing and desiring? And when that desire it conceived, what does the Bible say? It gives birth to sin. Sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death. She wanted more than what she had, but ended up with a monumental loss. So the crafty serpent weaved that temptation, you can be like God, knowing good and evil. Eve looked for the ultimate promotion, running Eden. Does that sound familiar? Bow down and worship me, and I will give you all of this, the temptation of Christ that he defeated. But in Eden, Eve ate, Adam ate, we all ate. And sin was that transgression of God's law, and the mother of all idols took root in our hearts, the idol of self. So Eve chose to eat the fruit, but in reality, Eve chose Eve, and Adam chose Adam. And their eyes were open, and they saw themselves now in a completely different way, and it was not pretty. I wonder, do you think there might have been mirrors in Eden? I imagine a little store on a side street in paradise with mirrors everywhere and Adam and Eve entering. And what did they see in those mirrors? Nakedness and shame. But the salesperson said, don't worry, we have a wonderful selection of fig leaves. And Adam said, by the way, do you have a needle and thread? But their eyes were open, naked and ashamed and afraid. Could it get any worse than that? The creature hiding from the creator and then the grand cover-up to boot. Shame is fear of exposure. First of all, the hiding. Adam, where are you? You know, it's not wise to play hide-and-go-seek with God. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, right? Keeping watch over the evil and the good. But Adam was hiding. But we know, is it, that by the grace of God... God pursued Adam. Christ came into the world to seek and save sinners. God is pursuing. But we see that initial in Eden, the hiding of Adam, and then the nakedness, our worst nightmare, to be seen, to be exposed, humiliated. A horrible dream that we can't wait to wake up from, that exposure of our nakedness. Yes, we flaunt nakedness. We parade it on the streets. We flood the internet with it, but it will always and only ever stir up and reveal shame. To the perpetrators, to the victims, to the users, nakedness brings shame that takes root in our hearts. But later in chapter 3 of Genesis, it God clothed Adam and Eve with skins. So God's grace, God clothed their nakedness. And lastly, in the garden, we see the blaming. Well, Eve blamed the serpent, and Adam said, it's a woman you gave to be with me. So the 
the idol of self must be preserved. Blame puts the, the focus on someone else because this idol of self needs to be maintained and nurtured. But God's curse was the inevitable result. Reminder now that Jesus became a curse for us. But these touch points of shame, it, the fall into shame in the garden, fear, hiding, nakedness, and blaming. And then we look at it as if I, I said we all ate. So in the second part of the sermon, I'm thinking about shame on you and shame on me, the reach of shame that goes into our hearts. There is a difference between guilt and shame. Last week, we looked at sin. Guilt goes into a courtroom with a judge, and you yourself are there, and the judge, you did something wrong, and you have to deal with that. But shame is different. Shame lives in community. And through the, though the community itself can even feel like a courtroom, and it's saying to you, you don't belong. Shame says you are bad. Guilt says you did something bad. Shame says you are bad. And what a prison that becomes for us. We might see shame as instrumental in our story of salvation. For me, it was deep shame before I came to the Lord. Sexual immorality and all of the pain that that caused. And the, but then coming to the point of actually an anxiety that I had to deal with. Shame bringing an anxiety to me that ultimately led me to seek a way forward, and it was the gospel, hearing the gospel. So well-placed shame, we might say. God uses shame, and in the, in the positive sense, it leads us to the cross. When we bring shame to the cross, that is God's use of shame in such a powerful way. Shame brought me to the cross. Different testimonies we hear week in, week out at our church. God at work, baptisms, as we take communion. We're reminded of bringing our hearts to the cross and to Christ. Paul would write, what fruit did you have then in the things of which you're now ashamed? So we're looking at the new man, right? The old man rooted in shame, but bringing that to the cross. So well-placed shame is revealed and, and confessed shame. But you and I deal with much misplaced shame, and that's what we're dealing with mostly today. Shame is everywhere spreading its lies suffocating life and relationships. It suffocates Christian fruitfulness, and it kills community. It says you're unworthy, you're unacceptable, you're unlovable, you are less than you should be. You're not beautiful, you're not good enough, smart enough. We are robbed of joy and friendship. We're robbed of a spirit of thankfulness. It imprisons, it loves concealment, it, it makes us back into a corner. Most counselors would say today the number one issue facing Christians even is shame. Some of shame's lives would be, first of all, body shame. The lie, our body with its imperfections is something to be ashamed of. If only I was like this. If only I could change this about me. We spend lots of money trying to overcome our physical liabilities Chasing an appearance that we think will make us happier. You know, it was a number of years ago, you know, I got out the straight edge razor, gave myself a quick shave before church, and looked back in the mirror, and there were at least six or seven bloody cuts on my face. My first thought was, I cannot be seen in public. Fearing that someone might see who I really was, I was afraid. Revealing not just my appearance, but my ineptitude. Shame just kind of makes us think about self, right? How are they going to view me? Can I bring this cut-up face into the public setting of my church? I was concerned. I said, Barb, just tell him he's got a heck of a fever or something. <laughs> but anyways, body shame. Even those little ways remind us that we worry a lot about appearance. And we worry about how we might be seen and understood by others. And just a note here I want to say to dads, to daughters, how what a wonderful opportunity we have as dads to tell our daughters how beautiful they are and how precious they are and how loved they are. 
and that you might give them a refuge that one day they'll see through you that the heavenly father who receives us for who we are loves us for who we are and and enfolds us a dad's heart can be such a refuge you are a gift to your daughters and you can give them a wonderful wonderful gift that their interaction with men down the road will, will they'll have a refuge of their father's heart to actually know what's good and so in this body shame right now start to plant an understanding that you are beautiful your design you're fearfully wonderfully made by the lord and marvelous are his works and and point and all of us need to be reminded of just its inner beauty, isn't it? Body shame, but sometimes let not your beauty be the outward adorning all the time. Of ranging hair and wearing gold, putting on fine apparel, Peter would say, but rather let it be this hidden person of the heart with an incorruptible ornament of a gentle and quiet spirit. There is nothing more for us really to adorn. We are clothed in Christ. Body shame. And social shame. The lie is you don't belong, you don't fit in, you're not good enough. It's safer for you to do church at home. Do you find it hard to come through the doors of the church? Do you find it hard to mill around the foyer after church? It kind of comes from this little prison we're, we're in, as they say, of just this social shame that really deep down, I don't fit in. I'm not good enough. Do I really belong? And it's, it's a lie that shame gives us. As I said earlier, shame limits our, our sense of fellowship and limits our community. And if we might recognize it for that, and, and so sometimes we just feel isolated. But when we see again that self-idol, that Eve choosing herself, and now all of a sudden you've got to kind of defend it, you've got to look good, you've got to be have a certain identity. And when we're thinking as well of social media with social shame, like keep showing the highlight reel. Don't let them see the full analytics of you. A place where we don't need to become vulnerable. A place where we can ignore brokenness and ignore really where the rubber meets the road of our lives, where our real need is. So social media is a place where shame can keep hiding, keep concealing itself, keep us in a prison. So this shame that reaches into our, our lives, body shame, social shame, shame thrives in secrecy. So say yes to solitary pursuits, not communal ones. Overwork, overcommit, say yes to everything and just do, do so that you might actually, your reputation might be okay. But there is nothing more that we need to prove, do we? Because we're united with Christ, who's finished the work. So a social shame, we need to kind of let go of just keep trying to prove and keep trying to keep the mask on. And lastly, performance shame. Coming from the lie that our work, success, and accomplishments are what makes us have worth. It, shame keeps us from being honest about who we really are, our less than perfect moments. We're driven to perfectionism so people might not see our imperfections, lest they be noticed and judged. Shame might tell us that we can be the best at whatever we do. Whatever we do, this performance shame, well, we can be the best at it, and we try to be the best at it. And that leads to envy, doesn't it? It leads to jealousy. So performance shame, that nothing good can come from that and destroys community. The only performance needed, really, is Jesus' work on the cross for us as his children. So there's nothing more to do, for we are free in Christ. One woman writes, I'm saturated with shame. Body shame every time I try to trying a new pair of pants. Social shame when I go to the gym, a church, a party. Performance shame when I look at all my unanswered emails. Shame is everywhere, touching every emotion. Shame because of my irrational fears when I lie awake at night. I live my life in a never-ending shame narrative. It must be interrupted by a better, truer narrative, a story of God's pursuit of wayward 
shame-filled and shaming people. My own thoughts is that this topic was meant for me. Just to recognize that shame does live in my heart. A certain type of performance shame. You know, just being part of a church staff. I often come on the way to church on a Wednesday, and, and you're coming, you're meeting up with James and Utah and, and Matt and, and the staff, and you kind of say, do you know what, Lord, I just don't feel like I can pray properly. I just don't feel like I got something to offer. And a little bit of it is, is my own shame. It's a prison I put myself in that doesn't free me up to just be me. And a social shame at times. Sometimes, I myself, you're, you're walking the foyer. You kind of say, I just don't know. There doesn't seem to be anybody here I think I need to talk to. And a little bit of that just to relax and, and to, to, leave the, to recognize my shame and to deal with it. You know, I was pulling weeds in the garden this week, and our garden's like a cement sidewalk right now. I keep getting these shoulder pains from the hoe, you know, just kind of. But pulling the weeds out, the, the, the roots, I couldn't believe, even the little blade of grass, roots go way down deep. And that's what I felt with my shame. I just needed this sermon topic just to think about shame. And, and it's a number one issue, and it's a number one issue for me, and it quite possibly is for you, that, that keeps you from thriving and flourishing. So I said one woman's story and my story and your story, we can add to it. What's your story that might involve the shame that might be keeping you from abundant life in Christ? So that leads us to our last section of the sermon, what's a way forward for us? And I borrowed something from Ray Ortland Jr., who wrote the gospel for Nine Marks Ministry. He's just a really, a man who looks very closely and deeply at the church. He says, this is the ethos equation for a healthy church, gospel plus safety plus time. And that is a little bit the essence of this sermon. What ethos do we need at Maple Avenue? Well, it's in this ethos equation of gospel plus safety plus time. Looking first at gospel, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. We see him interacting with those in deep, deep shame. The Samaritan woman came to the well at noon, loaded with social shame. And, and wanted to be separate and isolated, didn't want to hear comments and whispers or condemning looks. But she met a Savior there who engaged her. So this gospel of Jesus Christ, he comes close to those that are filled with shame. And to the point where, you know, shame likes to isolate. She was isolated. What did she do in that story? She ended up running back to the community and saying, you know what, I found someone who I think really loves me, and he knows me. There's a woman who came to Jesus with 12 years of blood flow, and she wanted to sneak up in anonymity and just to reach out and touch his garment. And that's how much shame, the uncleanness of this blood flow and the uncomfortableness and the, the no way to find comfort, but she went to Jesus and Jesus knew her true need, and he said, who touched me? He felt power come out of him. And eventually, this woman was identified as the one, and Jesus says, your faith has made you well. He didn't heal just the blood flow. Like, he drew her into community. And here's a woman laden with shame, wanting to come isolated that she might be healed. And what did Jesus did? He, he, he drew near to her. The woman caught an adultery that was that was seen as a sinner. And what did Jesus do? He got down low and he said, let him who is without sin throw the first stone. This woman caught in adultery. Do you know that what shame does? Shame continues to condemn. Remember I said in the courtroom, the, the, the community can actually be the courtroom that, that just kind of keeps condemning you in this prison of shame. But what did Jesus say to that woman? Where are your accusers? Well, neither do I condemn you. The shame of who she was and what she was all about, Jesus said, I do not condemn you. Now go and sin no more. Freedom from shame that again lifted her up to freedom in community. And the leper, 
Jesus met a leper. What, can you make me clean? And what did Jesus do, this leper who were unclean and isolated and, and don't go near them? Jesus, what, reached out. The first step of healing to Jesus was reaching, reaching out to the one so filled with shame. This man bound in leprosy, and he reached out to touch him. And Jesus brought cleansing and moved with pity. He said, I, I can heal you. Be clean. This is what Sam Aubrey says in, in light of that, that man with leprosy. He says, Jesus' cleanness is a far more powerful contagion than the dirt that is in us. There's always more that's right in Jesus than what's wrong in us. There's more grace in him than offense in us. There's more forgiveness in him than sin in us. The very worst in us cannot compete with the best that's in Christ. We can't sully him, but he can purify us. And however deep our mess goes, Aubrey finishes, Jesus, God's holiness goes deeper. We will never exhaust the holiness of God. So this gospel, this Jesus coming alongside those who were shamed and broken. So the second part of the gospel is just the same shame of Jesus' own suffering. Turn with me now to Hebrews chapter 12. Not quite one end of the Bible to the other, but we are going near the back of the Bible. Hebrews chapter 12. This last part of the sermon centers on, on these first two verses. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. The shame of Jesus' suffering. Of course, there was bodily shame, beaten, whipped, and mocked, and spit upon. He says, I gave my back to the one who struck, the cheeks for them to pull out my beard, and I didn't hide my face from disgrace and spitting. The shame that Jesus endured in his suffering. And dissimilar to Adam and Eve, it says, Jesus said through Isaiah, I turned not backward, and I was not rebellious, but kept my face focused on the Lord and on my Father. And then the cross on a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of what? Suffering and shame. So this shame of our Lord Jesus Christ, the shame of the suffering, the shame of the cross. And he endured it. Jesus endured the cross, and he despised that shame. Isaiah would also write, Jesus set his face to Jerusalem knowing that he would not be put to shame. He despised the shame. He took the shame, but he himself entrusts himself to God, knowing that he would not be put to shame. Jesus shamed shame. He despised and scorned shame. So gospel plus safety, looking to Jesus, seeking a refuge. What's the safe refuge that we have in the church? As we look to Jesus, we're not trying to hide from him, are we, like in the garden, but we're to hide in him. We're looking to the one who is the author and the perfecter of our faith. We're not, it's not our job to, to make ourselves perfect. We're looking to the one, this refuge, who perfects us, who draws us to himself, and we can hide in him. I love when the psalmist writes, they looked to him and were radiant, and their faces were not ashamed. Psalm 34 Psalm 32, 7, Lord, you're my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with songs of deliverance. So regardless, I said earlier, of the mess we're in, regardless of our shame, we have a Savior to look to and a refuge. And I just want to make a note here. I think about real horrific abuse that can happen 
We know of lots of situations, some of us might have been involved in some, something like that, where there's horrific abuse, sexual assault, whatever it might be. There's a woman in the Bible that, that endured that. Her name was Tamar. David's son, King David's son, Amnon, loved Absalom's sister, Tamar. And him and a, and a friend decided, well, this is how I can isolate you with her. And what did he do? He said, let the king come that she might help you during a sickness. Pretend you're sick. And what did he do? He actually closed the door and he, he raped his, his half-sister. And then it says he hated her after that with as much as he loved her before. And he just kind of cast her out. And Tamar found a refuge in her brother's house. Tamar lived her life with her brother Absalom. And I think that's a little, that was a way forward for Tamar. Where can she go? And I just want to make note that we do have a refuge, and it's in the house of God. It's with Christ, not Absalom's house, which is okay for a sister, but for us who are abused, Christ comes, and he comes for the broken, the abused, the hurt, the ones loaded with shame. We can trust our shame with the Lord, our shepherd. And I would invite you to find healing in the church. Healing in the church of God. God gives us his word, his spirit, and so many resources in this community to deal with horrible shame. So church family, our new spirit-sealed hearts are a refuge for each other. Just as we end up this sermon, to think about what's the fruit of the Spirit, it involves kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness. Paul would write to the, to the church in Ephesus, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. When we go through, there's a, you know, we go through school zones, we see this flashing light, slow down. Slow down here, because this is a school zone. Well, the church is a place, let's just slow down and be the refuge we need to be. This is a Christian zone, a zone for weary travelers that to help get them across the street, to enter the building, to find rest and refreshment, to be loved, to be prayed for and listened to. There's no condemnation to be preached here. There's no condemnation from the Lord to the woman caught in adultery to those who are in Christ and come to him and bring their shame to him, you will not hear condemnation. You know, Paul would write in the Philippians, let love abound with wisdom and discernment. Well, what does that look like? What does wise and discerning love look like? It understands there's shame in each one of us. It understands how broken we are, and we can come together in such a wonderful refuge. Jen Michelle writes, until we're allowed to be the mess we are, we'll continue the lying, the hiding, and the pretending. So at Maple Avenue, let's just come, and we're coming to Christ, come into the light. Shame does not want to be exposed, but coming into the light and recognizing we're all broken, are we not? My mom used to, we watch Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. You know, you get excited all day. It's on TV at night. And mom said when they show that misfit island, she used to stop and say, that's the church for her. Toys that nobody could really want. And, and the church is a place where we can come into the light as ourselves, and we can find, be vulnerable and find empathy, and we can find a hospital for the shamed, not a museum for saints. We can speak the truth and love to one another here at Maple Avenue. And not just this word that is truth, thy word is truth, but the truth about who we are, the truth about what's in our hearts. Shame disappears when we are known, when we're, we honor one another. Shame cannot stand the light of truth-telling and community. So lastly, just this time, gospel plus safety plus time to be still together, to pray, to show hospitality as I mentioned to you earlier, I'm a brother that deals with shame, and I know I live amongst a people who deal with shame. I want to see you as I need you to see me, that we might become more like Christ together, gentle, lowly, compassionate. So in our homes and our marriages, take time, spouses, be a cheerleader, and parents, 
take advantage of the time to delight in your children and, and build them up. So the invitation today is to come to Maple Avenue unashamed of the gospel, unashamed of our brokenness, unashamed of shame. And together we can run with endurance this race that's set before us. Room 115 at Georgetown Hospital for the past month was Barb Talbot and Debbie Rowlandson. And it was such a wonderful place. Each of those gals dealing with brokenness, broken lives, brokenness even physically at that time in the hospital, but it became a place of gospel love. Debbie was such a radiant presence in that room for all those times when Barb was fading, fading, fading towards death. And Debbie just said, shining sister. And when we came in together as brothers and sisters in Christ into that room, it was a refuge. It was like the church should be, this, this beautiful ethos of safety and a refuge together. So when Barb passed away and all that shame and sorrow was was swallowed up by grace forever. We can think of her finishing the race and keeping the faith. And that's a race set before us, and there's only one way to run in the spirit of gentleness and loneliness that our Savior has to us, and that we might be a church unashamed of shame and a safe place and a refuge for hope, healing, and true love. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the cross. Thank you for the shame that you endured. And thank you that the joy that was set before you that we might be set free from shame's prison, never rid completely of it, but yet bringing it to you that, we, that you might continue to lift us up because you revive the spirit of the lowly and the spirit of the contrite. So Lord, we need you. Draw near to us. We will draw near to you. In the days ahead, may they be wonderful days of true community and love here at Maple. In your name we pray. Amen.